You might note that there were some solos in there from some folks who don't usually do solos. Our second lesson for this morning is Luke chapter 18, verses 31 through 1910. Jesus is continuing on his journey to Jerusalem, and he's almost there. He's coming into Jericho, which was not far from Jerusalem, and this is kind of the final events before the triumphal entry. Listen for God's word to speak to you. Then he, Jesus, took the twelve aside and said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be handed over to the Gentiles, and he will be mocked and insulted and spat upon. After they have flogged him, they will kill him. And on the third day, he will rise again. But they, the disciples, understood nothing about all these things. In fact, what he said was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what was said. As he approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging when he heard a crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They hold, told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. Then he shouted, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who were in front sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he shouted even more loudly, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and ordered that the man be brought to him. And when he came near, he asked him, What do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has saved you. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him, glorifying God and all the people, when they saw it, praised God. He entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He, he was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and he climbed a sycamore tree to see him because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and say, he's gone to be guest of one who was a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, look, Half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord God, thank you for your word in our lives. That calls us out of the, the systems, out of the culture that we live, and calls us to a higher allegiance unites us with a kingdom of God that is not of this world. Fill us with your Holy Spirit that we may see and hear and know your word for us this day. 
Bless the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts. May they be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. As I mentioned before, this uh, narrative sort of finishes up this sort of second act of Luke. Jesus has done ministry all over the place, mostly starting in Galilee. And then in Ash Wednesday, we read that he set his face to Jerusalem. And he has now been on his way to Jerusalem to all the things that will happen there. This is the close of the second act, starting off the passion narrative of Luke. And we have several interesting characters here, don't we? Jesus comes to the city of Jericho. There's a blind man. This blind man apparently was not blind from birth, as some others that we have heard. But he sits at the side of the road and he begs. He begs for mercy, for small kindnesses, from those who are passing by. In fact, in this day and age that he lives, he cannot do anything but beg. He can only survive off of the kindness of others. But this fact that he is blind is not the major thing that sort of strikes out about him, though we know this. What is very striking about this man is his boldness. Everyone is excited that Jesus is coming in to Jericho. Perhaps they know, too, that he is going to Jerusalem. There is much talk about Jesus as the Messiah, the Anointed One. There are deep political implications to this statement because these people are not under Jewish law. They are under the rule of Caesar. They are an occupied territory of Rome, and so the idea that Jesus might be this king, this descendant of David, was a very interesting and hopeful thing, especially for those without power, those under the boot of Rome. And yet, most people knew just how very dangerous this idea might be. But this blind man, he does not care. This blind man hears that Jesus is coming in to Jericho. And he cries out, asks for healing, but uses a new title for the Gospel of Luke that we have not seen before, Jesus, Son of David. Not the Son of Man that Jesus usually uses for himself. Not Master or Teacher. He calls him Son of David, clearly stating and implying by Jesus' lineage that he is this Messiah that they are waiting for. This is a very dangerous statement to make, which is maybe why those around him tell him, quiet, quiet, don't call him that. But he does not quiet down. He, in fact, raises his voice even higher. Jesus Son of David, have mercy. The fact that Jesus is coming here into Jericho is deeply interesting for those who are of Jewish descent because perhaps they would remember that Jericho was the first city that the Jewish people had victory over as they came into the promised land. 
several thousands of years beforehand. There, there was also a a marginalized person, Rahab, a prostitute. She was on sort of the edge of her cultural life, but also on the edge of the city itself. And she welcomed in spies from the Hebrew army. She aligned herself with them because she knew of them and the God that they represented, and she wanted to be on their side. She used her position to hide those spies, even before the king of Jericho. She allowed those spies to go out of the city, out of her window on the outer wall, giving them vital information that they would need to gain victory. So perhaps it is not um, without consequence that Jesus comes into Jerusalem by way of Jericho. This blind man will not be quiet. And Jesus hears and calls him to him, asks, what do you want? He says, I want to see again. And Jesus gives sight to the blind. The first time in Luke's gospel, we have actually had a story where Jesus gives sight to the blind, bringing to an end that first sermon he preached in his hometown of Nazareth, proclaiming that the one to come would give sight to the blind. But this blind man is not the only one that we hear of. No, there's also Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is not a man who is outside of power. In fact, he is very close to power. We are told he is a chief tax collector. He is a direct representative of that power from on high, Caesar and Rome. He has lined himself directly with that earthly power of empire. Not only does he collect taxes from his fellow country members, he is in charge of several tax collectors. Now, we've talked to them about them before, but we will remind, uh, I'll remind us that the tax collectors were not viewed as good people. In fact, they were very much hated. Anybody a fan of the IRS? Even when, well, that's true. He's married to the IRS. Um, no. <laughs> um, even, it, maybe some people have different ideas about taxes and whether it's good to pay taxes or not, but if the IRS calls you and you're not married to them, then it definitely has a little bit of a, ooh, what's going on? Well, these tax collectors were not just tax collectors. It was well known that not only were they aligning themselves with this oppressive power, but they misused their authority. They would collect more than was necessary, and they were all very rich. In fact, we are told that this Zacchaeus is rich. As we've been reading through the Gospel of Luke, especially over the last several chapters, that might give us a little bit of cause for alarm. Jesus and Luke's account is not very kind or has not been over the last several chapters to those who are rich. In fact, in between the last story that we told and this one, there was a rich young ruler who comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to gain eternal life? And Jesus says, you have to give everything away and follow me. And he walks away very sad because he had many riches. And Jesus turns to his disciples and says, how 
hard it is for those who are rich. In fact, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to go into heaven. And their statement is, then, who in the world can get saved? Zacchaeus is this rich man. Zacchaeus is this man on the side of empire. And he just wants to see Jesus. But Zacchaeus does not misuse his power. He's short of stature. He cannot see over the large crowd that is gathering to see Jesus as he walks by. It's a parade. Zacchaeus could have used all of his power. Could have said, step aside, important tax collector coming through. I want to be the front of the line. But he doesn't. He doesn't order people aside. He doesn't misuse his power. No, he does something quite different. He runs. In Jewish culture in the first century, running for a man would not be, or any adult, would not be distinguished. It's not seen. It's not done. He runs. He hikes up his robes and he runs to the head of the line and then he climbs a tree. If running would have gotten eye raises from those around him, climbing a tree, which is absolutely positively only something children do, would have gotten even more. And yet Zacchaeus is willing to act the fool, to humble himself, climb up a tree just so he can get a glimpse of Jesus. And in response, Jesus says, Zacchaeus, I'm so glad to see you up in that tree. Come on down. I'm going to go to your house today. And so this chapter ends, a chapter that started with a Samaritan town not wanting to open their hospitality to Jesus because he was on his way to Jerusalem, ending with a tax collector, opening his home. Zacchaeus says, Lord, I I give half of everything that I have to the poor. If I, if I have defrauded anyone, I give four times as much. There's some disagreement about how this should be interpreted, but it is in the present tense. So either, as, is commonly, as we commonly see this, he has now making a change. He will now give over half of all that he possesses, and he will gladly refund those he has misused his power against. Or he may be stating this is something that he is already doing. So when Jesus says, this truly is a son of Abraham, it may be a display that he now, by his repentance, has come in to this great place. An answer is given, how will the rich go into heaven? This short-statured man is the answer. Or it could be a mark of repentance for those gathered who had made certain assumptions about Zacchaeus because he was a tax collector, because he didn't fill, fulfill all their thoughts of what it meant to be a true member of the community. And Jesus says, look, this one also is part of your family. There was a middle-aged woman named Rosa. She was African-American, colored at the time. 
and she got on a bus in Birmingham, Alabama. She, ha- she sat in the well-defined colored area until the bus driver moved the sign back. The three others, at his request, got up. They moved back to the back of the bus, and she said, no, I will not. He said, I will call the police. And she said, go ahead and do that. She was arrested. Malayla went to school. It was hard for her because under the new Taliban laws, girls were not allowed to go to school. And yet she showed up with some of her classmates, claiming the right of education. In fact, she started writing a blog for the BBC under a pseudonym to let people know exactly what it was like in her small town of Pakistan. Greta, on the other hand, did not go to school. For three weeks, she spent her time outside the Swedish parliament demanding that they pay attention to climate change, claiming that they were stealing her future. There's a word in the English language, uppity. Maybe you've heard it, maybe even you've used it. This word carries great racial prejudice weight to it. In fact, it's usually used for someone who should be on the outside and should act as if they're on the outside and yet are acting as if they're not. A blind man crying out, making a racket. A tax collector climbing a tree. A woman sitting in a seat that by law is not hers. Young women standing up for their future and their rights. And a carpenter from Nazareth. Walking to parades into Jerusalem. Accepting the title of Messiah, the one who would come and yet proclaiming before his disciples and all around him that even their understandings of what that meant were totally different. Who did not take up arms in political revolution, even those within, even though those within his own inner circle wanted him to. But like a sheep, was led to the slaughter. That one did take up a throne room. Not one in Jerusalem, not one in Rome, but at the right hand of the living God. And so surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses of those who are uppity, who speak from the margins, who proclaim truth even when it's uncomfortable, we throw off and cast off all the things that weigh us down and follow the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. 
Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Amen.